right, listeners, welcome back to Sustainability Defined, where Jay and I are here defining sustainability one concept and one bad joke at a time. Jay, today the bad joke's going to be flying fast because we are covering high-speed rail for episode number 43. Scott, if the jokes come at regular speed, given high-speed rail's efficiency, (laughs) they should be coming at you two to three times as fast. Listeners, hold on to your seats. Ooh, there's a stat. All right, Jay, well, tell (laughs) tell the listeners what they're going to hear. Listeners, we will be departing our journey and first asking (laughs) what qualifies as high-speed rail. We'll then ask what's the history of high-speed rail, followed by where does high-speed rail exist today? After that, Scott, we will branch into Mm. some of the reasons that high-speed rail is considered to be sustainable, then ask what are the criticisms of high-speed rail, then ask what... Gotta be be on balance. Right, we're we're objective folks here. Mm -hmm. Next question, what are some of the future plans to build more high-speed rail and what typically holds those projects back? And then listeners will be pulling into our final destination for this trip, covering more on the U.S. High-Speed Rail Association and its president, Andy Coons. And I think, you know, you get a nice little parting gift at the end, maybe a little mint. And and just that not a, thing? a fantastic experience, too. Smooth <laughs> at that. Okay, and you get reward points. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, Jay, what qualifies as high-speed rail? This is a little important to get down. And the definition of high-speed rail differs depending on where you look and who you ask. The U.S. Federal Code says the trains that reach quote, sustained speeds of 125 miles per hour, end quote, count as high speed. There are other speeds listed in other sources, but Jay, we feel like the U.S. Federal Code, pretty authoritative. So we hereby deem sustained speeds of 125 miles per hour as what qualifies as high-speed rail. Insert gavel slam sound effect now. Scott, I feel like this is... Do we have the budget for that? Scott, I feel like this is the ultimate payoff of your JD right now. You know, the ability Uh to do this. So so here's Mm -hmm. to you. So other than speed, high-speed rail is different than traditional train lines in a few ways. For one, the curvature of high-speed rail train lines is far more gradual, meaning gentler turns relative to highways or older train lines. This is to account for stability when high-speed rail train cars hit these turns at such high speeds. Number two, as basic as it might sound, high-speed rail train cars just look fast. I love this. They do. Compared to old-fashioned trains. Their noses are designed to be more aerodynamic and reduce noise. So, Scott, let's send our apologies to Thomas the Tank Engine, who's clearly not high-speed rail material. Maybe he just needs a nose job. Hey, (laughs) Thomas, there's hope for you yet. (laughs) And finally, Scott, high-speed rail lines are typically grade-separated, which means that they sit on top of a bridge so they do not have to intersect with cars, which, of course, allows them to move along at top, top speeds. Okay, so we now know what characteristics make up high-speed rail, what qualifies. Let's talk history. So back in 1830, the steam engine dubbed the Rocket debuted on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. So, Jay, this train didn't go as fast as 125 miles per hour. It actually went just 36. <laughs> so listen, listeners and Jay, apparently, may Scott. We've all got to start somewhere, Scott. Mm-hmm. But I will have you know that a member of Britain's parliament was hit and killed on the opening day of the bullet. <laughs> um, I do like the name, though, and I have to say that it reminds me of one of my favorite characters, Rocket the Chet Stedman from Rookie of the Year. Gary Busey at his finest, my friends. Scott, when you shared with us that this British member of parliament got hit and killed by one of these relatively now slow-moving trains, it makes me think of that scene from Austin Powers, you know, where he has that, like, steamroller and he's going towards that guy and the guy's screaming and Austin Powers is screaming mm-hmm, yeah. from across the room and he never moves. Tragic, <laughs> tragic ending there. Yeah. All right, so Scott, let's fast forward huh, to nice. when Japan opened the world's very first high-speed rail line between Tokyo and Osaka, just in time for the 1964 Olympics. Italy is also credited with Europe's very first high-speed rail line itself, opening between Roma and Firenze in 1978. France soon followed in 1981 with a line from Paris to Lyon. Are you just, is that, were you, is that the right way to say those cities? I'm pretty sure I got the Italian ones right. I've heard Paris uh-huh. enough, and I will admit to looking up how you pronounce Lyon. Oh, you looked it up. Very I nice. Did. Okay. We're, we're, we're all about accuracy here on the podcast, <laughs> so well done. So where does high-speed rail exist today? 
let's look at that now that we've got the history under our belts. Since those early high-speed rail trains in Italy and France, Europe has built up an extensive rail network. Spain has actually spent more money on rail than roads since 2003. In fact, Spain's Alta Velocidad Española okay. network is the longest high-speed rail network in Europe at over 2,000 miles. That's over half the distance to Earth's core. Did you like that flourish at the end there? That okay. was beautiful, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> so... While impressive, Spain's network is beaten only by China, and it beats it by a long shot. China mm, has more... More than, than a mile. <laughs> far more than a mile. So, China has more than 19,000 miles of high-speed rail, or nearly four trips to the Earth's core. That's more high-speed rail than the rest of the world combined. Oof. And, and Scott, wrap your mind around this. Just in the year 2000, so not even 20 years ago, China had absolutely no high-speed rail. And at that, just over the last decade, China built most of its high-speed rail network and its share of high-speed rail activity, as measured in passenger kilometers, went from 4% all the way up to 62%, a massive increase. Okay, we, we have to bow down to China on high-speed rail. This is pretty <laughs> impressive, and, and we'll talk about that more later. Um, but recall that Japan, remember, Jay, they built the first high-speed rail in the 60s? Well, since that time, it's moved more than 9 billion people on its high-speed rail network without one casualty. And high-speed rail was spread across the globe in a couple other areas. Saudi Arabia actually opened the first high-speed rail in the Middle East in October 2018. It connects two of the holiest cities in Islam, Mecca and Medina, and it travels that 280 miles between the two in just two hours. Africa also got its first high-speed rail line in 2018 that connects Tangier to Casablanca with speeds reaching 200 miles an hour. The hope is that this $2 billion train will spur tourism and development, but some say it's more along the lines of misplaced funds in a poor country where so many lack basic necessities. I will say that my brother has some pretty crazy Morocco travel stories. The train's probably nice, but there might be some, some interesting uh, dicey spots once you get out. He plays his cards right. He can come on and tell the listeners about it. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> okay. So in the U.S., there are no high-speed rail lines that meet our definition, Jay. And some of our listeners might be like, well, what about Amtrak's Acela? Isn't that high-speed rail? Well, not so much. It opened in 1999. It goes between D.C. and Boston, but it only reaches 150 miles per hour for only 34 miles of its 457-mile span. It actually averages only 85 miles per hour over its full route due to limitations of the tracks. It doesn't have that curvature, Jay, you were talking about and overhead electric lines. Scott, the U.S. has room for improvement, which we will touch on later. Mm -hmm. Out of our left-hand window, we'll be passing our question asking, what are some of the reasons that high-speed rail <laughs> is considered to be sustainable? Well, one reason is because almost all high-speed trains run on electricity as opposed to diesel trains. The fact that it is electric is also part of how it's able to reach such high speeds. Electric trains simply are more efficient. Diesel trains, by comparison, only transfer about 30 to 35 percent of the energy generated by combustion to the wheels. On the other hand, electric trains transfer about 95 percent of the energy to the wheels, a, a huge difference. Well, Jay, you're very persuasive, and <laughs> I agree that electric trains sound better than diesel, but basically every train in the U.S. is still running on diesel. Electrified rail is less than 1% of U.S. railroad tracks, while electricity supplies more than one-third of the energy that powers trains globally. We're behind. Yeah, but Scott, let's, let's bring us right back with another argument for sustainability here is that on a per-passenger-mile basis, the operational carbon footprint of high-speed rail is lower than that of automobiles or planes. A 2018 study looked at transit in Europe with planes versus trains and found a significant difference along many routes. Right. For example, from Paris to Barcelona, a plane emits 238 kilograms of CO2 emissions per passenger for a one-way trip, compared to only 11. So that was 238 to now 11 per passenger for a train. That's not even 5% of the emissions that we said come from a plane. And Scott, to put this in context, reducing transportation emissions is a big deal because according to our own US EPA, 
In 2017, the transportation sector was the U.S.'s largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, edging out even electricity and industry. Industry sounds like a big category, (laughs) and it beat it out. (laughs) As amorphous as the word sustainability, perhaps. Yeah, probably. Okay, so, Jay, let's consider the overall efficiency of high-speed rail when we're talking about sustainability. Let's talk about it in three ways. Okay. Give us the first. Right. So, So number one, in terms of passengers. One high-speed rail train holds 1,100 passengers and loads and unloads in just five minutes. That's the same number of passengers as nine airplanes, which can each take an hour to taxi and load and unload. Plus, you can simply tack a new car full of passengers onto the end of a train line to take even more people. It's very simple. And then the second efficiency metric is space. The direct and indirect land taken by cars of a three-lane highway is almost three times as much as a one-lane high-speed rail line. And Scott, when you multiply that across the incredible number of miles of highways across the U.S., that translates into massive potential space savings, you know? Mm Mm-hmm, yeah. So lastly, Scott, for efficiency is what we're going to call energy efficiency. So in 2016, rail globally accounted for 8% of the world's motorized passengers and 7% of its freight. Yet at the same time, It only accounted for just 2% of energy consumed in the transportation sector. The reasons for this energy efficiency include the passenger efficiency that we discussed just a second ago, the high efficiency of electric motors themselves, and the efficiency of fuel use resulting from the very low resistance offered by the steel-to-steel interface between wheels and tracks. And it's not so green, though, if all that energy is coming from fossil fuels. In the case of Japan and France, the trains actually run on zero emission nuclear energy, which we thought was interesting. And uh, the last thing, Jay, that we'll talk about in terms of why high-speed rail is considered sustainable is that it's also seen as an urban development tool, which I know your urban planning mind is, your spidey sense is tingling. That's my jam, Scott. Uh Uh-huh. Because these high-speed rail stations, they can be built in the heart of downtown or close to it with connecting lines. The term typically used to describe this is transit-oriented development. The thinking is that trains can reduce congestion on our roads and also drive development based on placing stations in areas that have walkable designs. Beautifully described, Scott, I must say. (laughs) (laughs) So listeners listening from D.C. or those that are familiar with D.C., consider the roslyn Balson area just south of downtown. City planners starting 30 years ago created high-density areas around the metro trains stations. Property values skyrocketed. Property taxes, interestingly, stayed the same due to increased tax revenue from businesses. And 70% of public transit riders in that area commute to the station by foot. And, Scott, on top of that, in China, high-speed rail has made Shanghai way more accessible. There are 75 million people living in the cheaper suburbs that can now get downtown thanks to high-speed rail in less than an hour. There are some cities, Jay, where you just sit in traffic for like an hour and a half and talk about the lack of productivity, at least in a train. I wonder if those people in the train, you know, they're reading, they're doing things. That's probably so much more productivity. You would think so, unless they're all, you know, scrolling through their Instagram feeds. And just well-being, too. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Fair. All right. Okay. So, Scott, in the interest of objective journalism, let's run through quickly some of the uh, criticisms that you'll hear about high-speed rail. Okay. Well, one is that there's land disruption, especially if you're building where there was no rail line before. It can also displace or disrupt current landowners. A second criticism is that there's significant carbon emissions associated with the construction of the rail lines because you're moving earth, you're tunnel boring, there's cement that's required. A third thing is that Emission reductions from high-speed rail, they only come if people avoid car and plane trips and planes don't fly to otherwise would and other infrastructure doesn't get built because of high-speed rail. If you're, you're doing all this train building and people aren't changing their behavior, you're not going to see all that much in terms of emission reduction. Scott, let's also not forget the fact that this can be freaking expensive. California talk about Adam. Talk about Austin Powers. <laughs> Freaking laser beams <laughs> on there. One million dollars. Uh, yeah. California's planned high-speed rail, which we'll get to more in a second, costs one hundred and forty-eight million dollars per mile. 
China at the same time does it at 30 million per mile because land acquisition costs are lower, labor costs are lower, and it mass produces the infrastructure. So Scott, backing out, High-speed rail in general makes financial sense when you have dense cities that are several hours of a car ride away, and ideally with flat land and areas that are important to connect to located in between them. Right, so high-speed rail isn't great in every situation. Consider this financial boondoggle. Love that word, Jay. Boondoggle. boondoggle. Mm-hmm. China built one largely for political reasons from Langzhou to Erunji where there is nothing notable between them on an 11-hour trip. The revenue from this train doesn't even cover the electricity to run it. Yikes. That's what, yeah. what we call a, a poor investment. Um, a boondoggle. But, but Scott, as you <laughs> as you just listed those two Chinese cities, we've covered so many different uh, languages and pronunciations just in this one episode. Well, we have been getting feedback right from our listeners, Jay, that they want us to include more non-U.S. stuff, so... Just giving the people what they're asking you shall receive. Mm -hmm. All right, Scott, let's talk about future plans and what might hold high speed rail back first, starting in the United States. So as we mentioned before, yes, we are lagging way behind the world on this front, but there is some serious action taking place at the same time. There are lines being discussed from Portland to Vancouver to Washington state, as well as Las Vegas to Southern California, but both are struggling with funding. So Florida, where everyone's grandparents live, <laughs> actually has some private train tracks built that go between Miami to Fort Lauderdale in 30 minutes and Miami to Long Beach in 60 minutes. Now, none of these trains are high-speed rail as we defined it at the top of the show. It was a conscious choice of those who built this to not grade separate because it was a way to save money and it was a way to build the thing even faster, even though it meant slower trains. Still, Virgin Trains, yes, Virgin of Richard Branson fame, plans to build to the Orlando Airport and Walt Disney World, as well as to Tampa with trains that go up to 125 miles per hour. Great news for Disney lovers worldwide. Mm -hmm. Scott, next let's chat about an interesting example of high-speed rail proposed between Houston and Dallas. So privately owned Texas Central Partners wants to build a line that would connect the two cities in 90 minutes with Japanese-style bullet trains that go upwards of 200 miles an hour. That's in contrast to the current three-and-a-half-hour drive, which I've actually made uh, countless times. Scott, visiting family between those two cities, a quick shout-out to Sam's Diner in Fairfield just off of I-45. But oh, nice. let's be real. We all know Texans love their cars, so we don't know if this will attract enough passengers to offset its cost. They have not secured the $12 billion needed, nor... All of the required land rights. So what do what should the listeners get at Sam's Diner? Their chocolate meringue pie. End of story. Wow. Okay. So speaking of land rights, Jay, you brought that up. I actually listened to an episode of the Eminent Domain podcast that is focused on this project. So that's 30 minutes, people, of glorious legal <laughs> intricacies. And the main takeaway for me was that this company wants to be like a railroad and have the power to survey and take land via eminent domain. But the Texas courts have actually said no, because a railroad is defined as in operation prior to some date long ago, or currently operating a railroad. Texas Central Partners is neither. I encourage people, check out this podcast if you want to learn more. Scott, alas, <laughs> we have now arrived at our California topic which mm -hmm. the state that hosts the only high-speed rail project in the U.S. that's currently under construction. So the initial plan was to build a line that spanned 520 miles that connected Sacramento to San Francisco to Los Angeles and Anaheim. They decided to build it in segments, with the first segment being the 119 miles between Bakersfield and Madera, which is in California's Central Valley. Right, and this California project is facing some serious headwinds similar to what the other projects are facing, Jay. They lack money, they lack political will. In California's case, the state is almost $50 billion short of the 77 it would need to complete the entire project. The governor announced last February that the state would move forward only with those 119 miles, Jay, that you mentioned in the Central Valley. So, Scott, some speed bumps there, huh? 
(laughs) But we can say that overall within the U.S., Americans want these trains and will use them. One 2015 survey found that when told of these cost and time-saving benefits, millennials and young people aged between 18 to 44 reporting strong likelihood of use jumped from 71% to 76%, both of which were already pretty high. So people like what they hear, Jay. Both about Hopefully people are liking the what they're hearing so far on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting kind of long. I appreciate the listeners sticking with us. This is good, though. This is good. And we'll just finish up here looking globally now. So remember China's more than 15,000 miles of high-speed rail, more than all the rest of the world combined? Well, it has plans to double that by 2030. It also wants to extend this network outside China through Thailand and Malaysia to Singapore. Classic China. Classic China. All right, Scott, in the United Kingdom, hot in the news right now is the HS2 line that has been in the works for 15 years. It would have trains exceeding 200 miles an hour and connect eight of Britain's 10 largest cities, including Edinburgh and Glasgow. There is concern about its spiraling costs and environmental impacts due to tunneling and land use. The hope is to have train service start by 2026. And thinking very long term, Jay, there is a super ambitious plan called the Africa Integrated High Speed Rail Network. It would build on and improve existing railways, include building more than 7,000 miles of new track to link all of Africa's commercial centers with high speed rail by 2063. I mean, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty long term plan here. <laughs> I don't know why 63 also. Right, what was wrong with 62? Yeah. There are concerns, though, about corruption and also relying too heavily on, you guessed it, Chinese loans. Scott, we would be remiss if we didn't at least acknowledge the Hyperloop system that's been in conversation for some time now and could go as high as 700 miles per hour. In a nutshell, a Hyperloop is a sealed system of tubes that can carry train cars with no air resistance at very high speeds. Listeners, you can visit Hyperloop-1, spelled O-N-E, dot com for more info and sleek interfaces touting how efficient the system could be. It's all test tracks for now, no actual lines until 2030 at the earliest. All right, and then there's the maglev, magnetic levitation trains. Maglev trains use magnetic repulsion both to levitate the train up from the ground, which reduces friction, and to propel it forward. There are maglev trains in operation in China, South Korea, and Japan. China, in May 2019, showed off a prototype maglev train that can reach speeds of about 375 miles per hour that it hopes to produce commercially by 2021. Scott, our high-speed rail train ride with listeners is pulling into its final destination, which is a spotlight on Andy Coons, who is the president and CEO of the U.S. High-Speed Rail Association. Andy is a national award-winning designer with a background in community design, urban planning, and sustainability. He has designed a wide variety of projects, including a number of new towns and transit-oriented developments. Andy started the U.S. High-Speed Rail Association, which focuses on advancing a modern national high-speed rail network across the United States. It envisions a 17,000-mile national high-speed rail network in the U.S., with state-of-the-art trains that travel faster than 200 miles per hour. The plan also includes a support network of 110 mile per hour trains connecting smaller cities and towns with the high-speed rail lines. So let's go to Andy, he's the expert. He started the whole association on the thing. All right, listeners, we are here in my work office. Uh, Andy (laughs) was very nice and came to our office to talk a little high-speed rail. So Andy, thanks for joining, got your nice LaCroix and an aluminum beverage can, all very nice. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> and so, Andy, let's jump right into it. I mean, you're described as a <laughs> longtime high-speed rail advocate. So how did you first get interested in high-speed rail? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I had to think about that myself, and I finally figured <laughs> out what it was. I grew up in the shadow of Walt Disney World mm. and the monorails and that whole future city idea of Epcot. Um, and so I grew up near Disney and with within those years when they were doing all that. And so I think that sort of planted the bug of trains in me. And, and you were telling us that this International Union of Railways, where you gave me their sustainability package, you went to their conference and that's what led to this chapter starting? 
Well, yes, um, and we're not a chapter. We are an independent association. We, we, um, I, I had been prior to that. I had just always been talking about high speed rail. But then when I went and attended UIC's big conference in Amsterdam in 2008, I was completely uh, taken. You know, just amazing how that was, and and the the size of it, and the and the technology of the trains, and then all the trains there in France, uh, and Amsterdam, and so decided then I asked the leadership of UIC about setting up a, a US chapter and at that time they were changing leadership and it wasn't really in the card so I just went ahead and started the US High Speed Rail Association myself because President Obama had just won the election and he was talking about high speed rail sure and so I said well we're really gonna need uh, an association to push this from outside the White House and the politics to, to build the support amongst the people all right so Andy this is a cool entrepreneurial story, right? You see this need, you go out there and create it. Now we're on the topic of trains. You are leading the U.S. High Speed Rail Association. And we are grappling with some some questions that to you will probably seem basic, but to us and, and our listeners, I'm sure it's, it's new stuff. So when we talk about a proposed high speed rail project, you know, you cannot always just create the land that it's built upon. So the question is, are most of the high-speed rail projects that you see on new areas of land, or are they maybe on existing areas of lands, like like adjacent to old rail routes? Um, it's kind of a mix of both, actually. But the, the bottom line is to do real high-speed rail, which we call true high-speed rail, or what, you know, the global standards, those are about almost 200-mile-an-hour trains. So we don't have any of those in this country right now. Our cell is not that. And, and so the, the difference is you really have to have its own set of tracks. You can be in a, in a shared right of way, but the tracks have to be completely separated, completely protected, completely, you know, with barriers separating uh, other things from them. And that's how you can get the 200 mile an hour speeds. And so that requires um, piecing together kind of a puzzle of, of land. And that's what California is doing right now. They, they have to use... Um, parts of highway rights of way, parts of existing rail rights of way, and new land that they have to assemble because those aren't always in the right places. That's the biggest struggle of getting these built is actually assembling the land. And so what happens? Because I mean, sometimes you can come across land that's maybe federally owned or state owned where you can assemble it more cohesively. But if you come across one tract right in the middle that you need that's maybe privately owned or is some is under some sort of different ownership structure, how do you bridge that gap? <laughs> no pun intended. Basically, that happens all the time. I mean, that's what right now California is behind schedule because there's a bunch of farmers and ranchers who don't want to sell their land. And so it, it, it comes down to two things. Either, either A, they don't want to sell their land, just period, they flat out don't want to sell it. Some of them, in, and they have legitimate reasons. Some of them, you know, have been in their family for a couple hundred years. Um, mm. Other cases, they play that game so they can get a bunch of money for their land. Mm. They, don't, they really will sell it, but they just claim that it's going to be a hardship and they want $50 million or something. So that's what happens. It ends up in court. Right now, I think California has many properties that are in that situation and in court right now. So did they start the California building process before they had all the land secured? They did. They is, had, that, it, is that the best practice? I mean, no, well, no, it's not the best practice, but they were forced to do that by the legislation, and uh, that was stimulus money. So they had deadlines they had to meet. Mm -hmm. They had to create jobs by a certain time. That's why the project is literally has problems, part of it, because they were set up with impossible odds. Okay, and maybe we can talk about some projects that are more privately funded rather than public, because like you're saying, they were driven by the legislation and other things. So with these private investments, is it typically the case that they do have all the land secured before they start building? No, it's the exact same situation. In okay. fact, that's the thing. Everyone says, oh, well, let's let the private sector do this. It's like, like they can magically somehow assemble land differently than somebody else can. It's the same problem. I mean, they're having that problem right now in Texas. That That's a privately led project, and that's one of their long challenges is mm -hmm. getting all the land. 
And, and Andy, I've got a, a follow-up question, and we might touch on this later on in the interview, but I know that your organization is U.S.-focused. However, I'm sure you have a global perspective as well. Of course, there are other countries that have been able to do this. So what has been their method for success in getting around these type of literal and figurative roadblocks? Is that more of a powerful state agency that's able to take over land more, more efficiently, more quickly? What is that? Uh, I would say the number one thing is they have leadership. They have government, top government leadership. For example, when France decided to build high-speed rail, it wasn't one guy that got together and tried to battle you know, the oil companies and tried to get it done. It was the president of France with all the Congress. The, the Basically, the leadership of France decided uh, as a nation, this is important and we're going to build it. And they led the charge. So that's what we're lacking here. But the interesting thing is here that when we build our highway system, that's exactly what we had. We had federal mm-hmm. leadership. We had yeah. federal planning. We had federal funding. They did all the engineering. They got the land. They assembled all the millions of miles of land that we assembled to build highways. I mean, they mowed down buildings and cut through cities and everything else. So now they're completely out to lunch and completely absent when it comes to doing anything with rail but does the inclusion of high-speed rail and the green new deal give you hope that in the future there will be this sort of leadership and investment oh and i didn't mean to sound negative i mean i think everything's changing right now we are Mm. absolutely at a tipping point and a period of rapid change and you know the whole idea of the green new deal the fact that they're that climate change is front and center in the presidential debates. That should tell you right there how things are changing. The most important thing I could say is that people get engaged and young people and people get active like they've been doing about the Green New Deal and the Sunrise Movement. We need that same kind of activity, pressuring, continue pressuring um, Congress and also state legislatures, and then suddenly they will start funding rail projects all over the place. So if you're talking to a young person and you're trying to get them engaged on high-speed rail and understand that sustainability benefits, what are the key stats or points that you point to? Like, what? How do you succinctly explain why high-speed rail is more sustainable than other forms of transit? High-speed rail is far more efficient than any other mode of transportation. It's literally about eight times more polluting to take a trip on a plane versus on a high-speed train. Polluting what, like emissions? Emissions. Okay. Yeah, and, and because, again, the, the beauty of high-speed trains is they're electric, so they can be powered by anything. And, and, the, and the, how you power them can continually evolve. As you build more and more renewable energy, you can phase out all the dirty energy, and it can be 100% and the trains are running either way. They don't care really how the energy is generated. And they're always electric. They're all electric. Rail. That's the beauty of high-speed rail. So there's no fuel involved. There's no fuel supply chain. I mean, I think a lot of people don't even realize how much fuel and energy is consumed just producing and moving fuel around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when, when you do it by electric, sure. you just touch a wire and there's like almost no loss of energy. I've heard that in like national security things too, with oh, the fuel totally. supply chain trying to get that out there. But totally, because right now we get two thirds of our oil from other nations, and and most of that goes to transportation. So this this goes right to the heart of not only sustainability but national security, uh, energy uh, predicaments with getting stuck, you know, having to go all over the world and get in these, you know war-torn places because that's the only oil left. I mean, that, that we're really in a vulnerable position right now with our dependence on oil. Mm-hmm. And it all goes right. That transportation is the absolute heart of that. And Andy, so we talk about the ability for high-speed rail systems to incorporate electricity, much of which could be coming from renewable sources. However, one of the things that I know both Scott and I really like about train systems is that they can take you really into the heart of a city. Whereas we come out here to Denver, where I live, Denver airport is located tens of miles outside of the city center. So you land and you have to take 30 minute cab from, well, I guess now there's a light rail that'll take you to there. But point being, it is way far out. However, trains can take you right into the center of a city. And I know that your organization is is bullish on this about the urban development benefits from putting high-speed rail in via what's called transit-oriented development, which is where development circles and, and centers around these transit stops. So is there an example that you typically point to 
that illustrates how building a train can specifically lead to this type of development that a lot of city dwellers tend to prefer. Well, the best example I can name that's the most current right now, and the train hasn't even come yet, is um, San Francisco, Trans Bay. Yeah. What's they, that? What's that? Uh, Trans Bay is the big new high speed rail station. Um, the entire basement is a is an empty room where the trains are going to come in. The track isn't even in there yet. Mm. The station's built. It opened. Um, there's there must be twenty five new skyscrapers that popped up around it. Hmm. Literally, I mean, it's it's unbelievable what that stimulated. And the trains aren't even there yet. <laughs> wow. Along those lines, Scott and I, as we've been doing our research, we've heard about. High-speed rail going into Texas, we referenced the one in San Francisco. There's one we've seen going from L.A. to Vegas and then even within Florida. But the question to you as a person with your finger on the pulse of this stuff here, at least in the United States, where else do you think it's feasible in the near future to install high-speed rail here? Well, the other big one that's brewing up and is, could actually even get built faster than some of the others is the Pacific Northwest. And... What you have there is um, kind of a confluence of all the planets lining up. And one of them is a major, major corporation pushing this is Microsoft. They decided to uh, make it their mission to get high-speed rail built, connecting uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Seattle, and Portland. And they, and they came at that conclusion because they realized that for Microsoft to continue growing and continue being an innovative company, they needed to have a lot of smart people be able to get together for brainstorming sessions on, on a regular basis. And that's impossible with our current forms of transportation. And so they started looking at what they call the Cascadia Innovation Corridor. And between all the Microsoft where their facilities are, some of the top universities and medical facilities and different things along that corridor, that if they were able to make a faster uh, mode of transportation that they could they could literally create another Silicon Valley, so to speak, or or there's already sort of is one around Microsoft, but to make it work better and and grow bigger and grow into more areas, and so they looked at high speed rail as one of their main solutions that they that to achieve this. Plus, the housing around there is so expensive. If you have a high speed rail with a couple stops further outside the city, but people can still get to work fast. Well, that might help a, solve that issue too. Great point. That opens up millions of new affordable housing options. And so for our listeners wondering where this is going to go in the future, you, you talked about being at a tipping point earlier. What should listeners expect? You know, is it just the ones we rattled off already and talked about in the intro? Do you think that there's going to be five, ten more lines in like ten years that are at least very seriously being discussed? Well, I, I think the answer to that question um, could be yes or no. It, it, it could be yes, but what it's going to take for it to be a yes answer is that a lot of people who are listening to this to actually get involved and, and start uh, mobilizing. Because what, we've seen this with the Green New Deal. When a whole bunch of people mobilize and start having events and showing up at Congress offices and getting you know major social media going and email chains going, suddenly things start happening. That actually pressures leaders to do things. Yeah, and we talked with the one of the co-founders of the Sunrise Movement in our last episode, which was about climate advocacy. Yeah, excellent. So uh, people should go listen to that if they're wondering how they had that sort of impact. But also in this interview, you know, you've talked about how high-speed rail stacks up against you know, multi-lane freeways and airplanes, and those are pretty powerful lobbies. What has been your experience going up against? those powerful forces as you've tried to push the high-speed rail agenda? They definitely are dictating our transportation policy now, and they'll continue do so, to do so if we all just let them. That's the point. I mean, if you, you look at Congress. I started researching members of Congress. When you hear someone coming out attacking rail or calling climate change a hoax, you go look them up and where they get their funding, and you see all kinds of oil money funding. In these people. And so it, it starts becoming more and more obvious that um, this, this oil money and auto and aviation money is literally f flooding our Congress. It's also flooding our state legislatures, where just to basically keep people not looking at rail, look the other way, focus on more roads. And mm -hmm. so it permeates our politics big time. And, and 
we definitely need the only way to counter it is with a lot of people a lot of people speaking out mm -hmm. because i don't know if we're going to ever be able to raise lobby money to to match the the coke brothers or the oil industry so uh but we do have people and bodies and and that's how we can get this moving and sorry it's, it's already happening the good thing is and there's already private investors coming which suddenly changes the game too and we've talked about the high-speed rail system that's going up in California a couple times now in this interview, for all of its merits, has run into some real issues. So from your perspective, what are some of the biggest lessons learned from their effort that can be applied to future and hopefully better high-speed rail projects here in the States? Well, I think one thing for sure is um, we, need, we need federal leadership on these and we need some bigger pots of money. Um, because when, when you do these projects in little pit and $1 billion increment at a time, now I know a billion is big, is a lot of money, but in high speed rail, that's small money, just like in building roads, that's small money. Mm -hmm. Um, so to, to go with a billion here and then a $2 billion there and then 2 billion more or two years later, that's the slowest, most expensive way to build these projects. We, we've had some of these international consortiums come to us who build these lines all over the world. And they say, we could build that project for 40% less if we could do it all in one shot and bring in all of our big equipment and, you know, all the economies of scale and, and some of the prefab stuff like China uses. You could bring those kind of things in and build it really quick and, and for probably, like I said, 30 or 40% less. Can you talk to us about high-speed rail globally just in the sense of what are some of the innovations or best practices globally that you wish we would do more here? China started building what they do is they build these giant prefab concrete sections that's literally this why is what an entire section of a bridge and it already has the track bed on top and they build the columns and they have these giant machines that come out and they just lower a big piece in one piece at a time like a lego set and build a whole bridge in like a couple days <laughs> so things like that can speed up much way faster construction processes and save a lot of money. So those are the kind of directions we need to be heading towards as this becomes uh, more institutionalized and, and becomes real here in America. So Andy, for listeners who want to see high-speed rail at its absolute finest, number one, where should they travel to to experience it? And number two, if they like it, how can they best support high-speed rail? A beautiful one, one of my first ones I rode was the Eurostar between Paris and London. It goes through the Euro Tunnel. That's a very sophisticated train. Um, that started, I believe, around 1997 or 1998 that opened. Um, getting it, and So you can go from downtown Paris, downtown London in two hours and 15 minutes. That's a great one. If you're anywhere in China, those are the amazing trains as well. All brand new, all state of the art, all built to huge scale so that the stations have like 20 tracks so they have plenty of room to grow as, as they need it. Um, so if you're in that part of the world, China or Asia, Hong Kong has one, Korea has one. Um, but anyway, so any of them you ride, I'm sure you'll love, you will love because they're just a pleasure to ride. There's so much... There's no hassles and, and headaches like flying, and you're not ever stuck like in a car on, on a highway. Uh, and they get so fast to the destination, you're actually surprised when you get there. It's like, wow, we're here already? And, <laughs> you know, you hardly felt the speed. You hardly felt the acceleration because it's all so smooth. Um, but really, that's, that's what we need to do. We need a lot of people getting vocal, pressuring their leaders to stop ignoring this and start funding it. And, and I'll tell you one thing a lot of people don't realize. They think, oh, money's tight and all that. We still spend in America every year over $200 billion widening roads that we really don't need and building you know, new roads that we really don't need. $200 billion between federal and state. Um, in fact, our Congress just passed, or was it the transportation bill? One of the two just had, I think it was... 178 billion more for roads. We just now approved it. Right. So if and if if people want to take action on this, you're saying talk to legislators. Is there anything else you would suggest our listeners do? 
Well, I would also suggest you get involved with the Sunrise Movement because Sunrise is pushing the Green New Deal, which has high-speed rail. So instead of trying to set up a whole separate um, advocacy organization, we just need to really grow the, the great one that's already taking shape and already has high-speed rail front and center in it. Uh, we think that has probably the most promise of actually getting done and, and getting a bunch of new people elected in the next election and then actually start launching policies and funding. You know, Scott, I think this is the first time a guest has so successfully plugged one of our own previous episodes. <laughs> so, Andy, thank you very much for that. And that's, uh, that's the one I listened to. It actually was really good. <laughs> oh, thanks, Andy. <laughs> He's, he has not been compensated to, to say this, we swear. Um, so, and Andy, you touched on this with the Green New Deal and, and energizing our base, but at its core, what gives you hope that we'll be able to achieve this vision of a robust high-speed rail network here in the States? But I, th I think that the fact that there's private investors interested in this now, too, is a big deal. I mean, that, sure. that, that was like, that was one of the things that the think tanks used to bash nonstop was that, oh, these are never-ending, have to be subsidized, blah, blah, blah. Well, the fact that Fortress Investments is now pouring billions into this. That's who owns the, the uh, Brightline system in Florida, and they've now partnered with Virgin. Richard Branson mm -hmm. himself is a billionaire. He's made a lot of money running trains in the UK. Um, and then you also have, <clears throat> in New York City, one of the big investment companies just paid $2.5 billion to purchase the Italian high-speed rail system. So here's an American Wall Street firm that's already invested owning a high-speed rail company. And yeah. they're, they're rapidly expanding it. They're gonna, their goal is to expand it all over Europe. That is interesting that uh, you know, this private sector has come in. It kind of gives credibility that this is worthwhile efforts. And, and they start making money once these open and they have real estate development. See, they're doing, yeah. they're doing it smart. They're adding the real estate development with it. So they're making money off the condos at the stations, and that helps enable them to spend this big money to build these rail systems. So the more they make, the faster they're going to build more lines. All right, Jay, I think we got to take the sponsorship money and invest it. <laughs> Andy's convincing the, me. The sustainability-defined branded high-speed rail. It'll take us a little while to get there. Virgin. Right. Virgin actually want, was trying to go public to yeah. sell stock in this. Hey. <laughs> um, so let's go to our final question here, Andy, which is let's pretend we're on that first high-speed rail train. And like you said, high-speed rail, sometimes it's like, wow, we're already at our destination. So it's good to have a party fact that you can give out quickly and impress someone before the train rides over. What is the one party fact that our listeners can give about high-speed rail to impress someone on the train before it gets there? The Pacific Northwest just released their study on what the high-speed rail will do. And they said it's going to cost about between 24 to 42 billion to build it and it's going to generate 355 billion in economic development over the course of how long uh, well probably 10 years I, I didn't actually hear a year but it'll yeah. be it happens fast when you see like i said what happened in san francisco the the tr the tr station started and already the cranes were popping up mm -hmm. well and i think that's a good point andy because you know when you're talking about this from the you know, real estate, urban planning perspective at li literally as soon. And if not even before the locations for these stations and stops get announced, land is already transacting. And then from there, it's all right, what are we going to do from here? So that's a pretty eye popping number as far as, you know, what we're going to invest in this system relative to the amount of economic you know, boom it's going to generate. So that, that's pretty awesome stuff. And that's what's good about it. It becomes a huge catalyst. It, it's a catalyst for all this infill development. It's a catalyst for building light rail and other rail systems to feed into it. And then all of a sudden now you're spreading the, the rail and the TOD benefits further, not just the high-speed rail station, but there might be – in fact, Seattle right now is building a massive light rail system, which will tie right into the high-speed. So um, you could have – walkable communities at not just the one or two high-speed stations, but the 150 light rail stations as well. It's all going to become like one big giant network. And that, that together transforms the whole region over time into walkable, sustainable type lifestyles. Exactly. So in a way, by supporting high-speed rail, you are also supporting this greater idea of sustainable walkable cities it's pretty awesome like it's a big it supports a giant transformation because that's what we really yeah. have to do if you think about it, our society with how much 
fuel we're burning and how much we're you know contributing to the climate problem a lot of that has to do with the forms of transportation and the way we build our communities so if we if we adjust those two things that's a huge solution yeah so i think what excites me here is it's not just a new mode of transportation that is fast and exciting it's this larger systems change that you're talking about around how we live it's a new as lifestyle communities. it's a new lifestyle so yeah. i appreciate you taking time to talk with us andy and you know keep up the good fight and like uh, people or like you said that the best ways to help out here is to make your voice heard and say this is something you want so hopefully our listeners will take that to heart i know jay and i will and we thank you again for your time and hopefully jay and i can join you on that first train trip <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely and i, I want to second that that our, keep this in mind, our politicians are not going to lead on this. They're going to lead only when they're pressured by all of us. All right. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me. Thank you, me. Andy. If you enjoy listening to our podcast, check out Building Local Power, a bi-weekly podcast from our friends at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Building Local Power features conversations that you won't hear anywhere else. Tune in for thought-provoking discussions of economic power and democracy, as well as new ideas on how communities can take advantage of their own economic futures. You can find them on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Scott, as this episode winds down, we can say that our not-so-high-speed look into high-speed rail has just wrapped up to the tune of a meager $80 billion. Mm. Uh We'll put out some bonds for it or something, right, Jay? <laughs> it just eminent some domains, Scott. You have good – the podcast has good credit. <laughs> so we want to thank the typical people, Square Peg Round Hole and Potions for the music. Uh, Morgan Abbott helped with a lot of research. My mom got some critical stats there at the end, so thank you to them. Samantha Birch and Annabelle Mercer continue to help us think through how we can better market the podcast and get the word out there. We also want to ask you to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast – and continuing on the tradition, Jay, here of reading reviews from people who take the time to leave that review on Apple Podcasts, Jay, read us one. Right, Scott. So D.H. Lewis says the following, quote, Scott and Jay break down the biggest, most challenging concepts in sustainability so you don't have to. This podcast is great for industry folks looking to expand their knowledge or anyone interested in how we actually make our world more livable and sustainable. Spoiler alert, they end each interview with having the guest give a cocktail party fact, so you always leave each episode with the most important takeaway. Just beautiful. Hmm. Jay, you know what we should do is we should put on our website all the party facts. Ooh, that's a good idea. Oh my god, okay. Uh, speaking of which, if other if listeners have great ideas like that, or feedback they want to give... Uh, please email us, hosts, H-O-S-T-S, at sustainabilitydefined.com. For instance, Jay and I think perhaps the intro on this episode was too long. If you agree, let us know, and we'll try to make them shorter. Uh, so that's it, Jay, I think, right? You all stay sustainable out there. I'm Scott Breen. And I'm Jay Siegel. We will see you next time.